The subject of this week's podcast is active shooter awareness and had been scheduled weeks in advance. Prior to the recording, we received news of the tragic shooting event in Gilroy, California. In the few hours since the podcast was recorded Saturday morning and released Monday morning, two additional shootings have occurred, one in El Paso, Texas, and one in Dayton, Ohio. An additional 29 individuals have been lost to senseless gun violence in these two tragic incidents. Our hearts go out to the friends and families of the victims of these tragic events. It is our hope that a solution is found where we as a society can come together to prevent such terrible things from happening in the future. Until that day, the best we can do is learn to adapt to the distorted reality we live in and try to be prepared in the event we face such terrible acts of terrorism ourselves. Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 27 active shooter awareness i'm your host joseph whalen and my lovely and talented co-host madison whalen hi everyone how are you doing today maddie pretty good so today we have a rather somber topic that we're going to talk about um this actually was already on the broadcast schedule for several weeks now i had actually prepped for this some time ago Mm mm-hmm um, and it actually was coming up in the schedule this week, uh, but unfortunately, it happened to coincide with an unfortunate event in California at the Gilroy uh, Garlic Festival. There was an active shooter there, uh, which resulted in the deaths of four people, including two kids, uh, and 12 injuries. Um, the really morbid fact that came out of the whole thing, I think, was that three of the people that survived the shooting in Gilroy actually had already survived the mass shooting in the concert shooting in Las Vegas two years ago, Um, which, if nothing else, is a a testament to how dire the times are now when, when not only are shootings occurring as frequently as they are, but when you've got victims that are showing up in multiple shootings, it's, it's tragic, it really is. So, uh, as much as I try to shelter you from these, you know, bad things that happen in the world, the fact of the matter is they do happen. And I think it's very important to be educated to know what to do when these things happen um, in the event that, God forbid, it ever happens to you. Um, so, I would much rather you be informed which risks exposure to these types of things than to not be informed and be at a greater risk of bodily harm if it happens. So today's topic is going to talk about active shooter awareness. Uh, Just as a uh, disclaimer, uh, I am not a security expert. I do not conduct training in active shooter drills or anything like that the information that's presented here is information that is presented in public forums um their proven techniques uh their their um it's information that's out there for everyone to use that has been developed by professional security individuals and law enforcement Um, If you have questions on this topic or if you have concerns, and I say this for the benefit of our audience, 
you know, feel free to do the research, reach out to your local law enforcement. Um, I know some of the schools are doing some of this type of stuff as well. Um, so do not assume that what I pres- what we present here is gospel. There is much more out there that you can learn. So with that in mind, uh, I'll run down the talking topics real quick. Uh, we're going to talk about what is an active shooter, information about uh, the characteristics of active shooters. Um, we'll talk about good practices for coping with an active shooter situation, how to respond when an active shooter is in your vicinity, and then we'll talk about what happens when law enforcement arrives and things to be aware of when law enforcement arrives. Just general information um, worthwhile keeping it at the back of your mind there. Hopefully you'll never need it. Um, but in the event that it's just like a fire drill, you know, hopefully you'll never need to, to, to know what to do in the event of a fire, but doing fire drills gives you that foreknowledge of what to do in the event that it unfortunately happens. So ready to get started? I guess. Okay. So what is an active shooter? There is an acronym called ALICE that stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Uh, There is a, the information that we use today comes from the ALICE Institute. And they define an active shooter as an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. In most cases, Active shooters use firearms, and there is no pattern or method to the selection of victims. Now, before we go on, I did want to ask you, Madison, um, does your school address active shooters or lockdowns or anything like that? Well, they've addressed lockdowns to us. They don't do it as often as they do with fire drills, but they do have lockdown drills and um, partial lockdown drills. Um, the partial lockdown drills are basically just where you make sure the door and doors and windows are locked, no one's in the hallway, and we just continue learning. A full lockdown drill was basically included to just go in some corner of the room where no one could see us through the window, and some of our and some of our teachers would have like a baseball bat and stand behind the other side of the door. So if an active shooter were to come into the classroom, they'd be ready to hit them. So your teachers typically do have some type of defensive weapon in the event that something happens. Yep. Now, do you have on-site, um, they're usually called uh, school resource officers, where you have police officers on premises at your school? Um, well, I do remember that um, they would sometimes call at least one police officer, and they'd make sure all the doors were locked during a full lockdown drill. And they'd knock on the doors, and um, they'd just make sure the doors were locked and that we were doing the drill correctly. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. So um, you understand what we're talking about when we say active shooter. Now, now the context in which we're going to talk about this is mostly going to be related to school, even though you know the couple of incidents that we cited here weren't school-related. Some of these techniques are still valid. Um, questions about what an active shooter is? Okay. Nope. So you know. All right, let's move on. So active shooter situations are unpredictable and evolve quickly. So we're talking about the characteristics and information about active shooter situations now. Uh, Active shooter situations are often over within 10 to 15 minutes. Were you aware of that? Um, no, I just know they don't have, they just happen suddenly and they are over pretty quickly. Yeah, and that's the thing, 10 to 15 minutes, so there's only a certain amount that you can do in that 10 to 15 minutes, and if you can protect yourself, your survivability rate goes up significantly as that clock wears on. Uh, Generally, response times from law enforcement or local security keep that time down where the damage is minimal and it's there's a lot of damage in that time but if you can survive that time it's that's where your survivability goes up active shooter situations 
are often over before law enforcement arrives on the scene. And this is typically because of responses on the scene itself, you know, and as you described in the case of school, um, your teachers have some knowledge of self-defense. They have some type of defensive weapon. They have some ability to respond. Um, and I'm sure, even though you probably don't see it in your active shooter training or your lockdown training, um, you'll probably find most of your teachers have gone through some level of training. Have they ever talked about, any of your teachers ever talked about the kind of training that they've gone through for this type of stuff? No, they're just basically on the other side of the room. Some of them just have like a type of bat or something similar to that. Now, do you know if any of your teachers have any self-defense training, karate, or anything like that? No. You don't know? Okay. All right. I'm they never talk about that. <clears throat> just curious, because I know a couple of my teachers in high school, uh, especially the phys ed teachers, had some type of uh, training in, in karate or self-defense or something like that. Um, and they actually wound up at one point in time giving uh, lessons internally in the school for basic self-defense you know, against kidnapping and, you know, stuff like that. So they say, in most cases, active shooters use firearms and there's no pattern or method to their selected selection of victims. Now, historically, that's not entirely true. I think what we found in situations where um, you have school violence, uh, the kids, the people that are doing the shooting tend to have a list of people that they're ideally looking for to, to do harm to. But the point to take away from this is they will fire indiscriminately in search of those people. They're, they generally don't come in just for the sake of shooting people. They're shooting certain people. But if there's other people that happen to wind up in their sights, they'll shoot them as well. Uh, they also go on to say that individuals have been known to act without firearms, such as knives or automobiles, or commonly available but possibly lethal tools and utensils. And, and one good example of this is an automobile. Uh, we talk about active shooters, and a lot of times the first knee-jerk reaction that the public has to dealing with active shooters is, well, that's banned guns. Well... That might stop some of these incidents, but if you have someone who's determined and to do harm and mentally unstable enough to do harm, if they can't get a hold of a gun, they're going to find some way to do what it is that they're trying to do. Uh, there was an, an incident um, a year or so ago where a man decided to drive a, a vehicle through a crowded festival of people at a street festival. He did about as much damage as you would have done with a firearm, too. So it's it's important to be aware that when we say active shooters, the term really should be active attackers because you can attack in various different ways. So the specific characteristics of an active shooter are that active shooters' intentions are usually an expression of hatred or rage rather than financial gain motives associated or motives associated with other types of crimes. So it's typically somebody who's gone over the edge. Um, there are a lot of different crimes out there that are financially motivated. Bank robbery, uh, petty theft, carjacking. You know, there's always some kind of financial motive in there. Um, and as a result, the crimes tend to be rather controlled. Right, So if someone's going to steal money from a bank, they don't want to go shooting up the place because it's going to draw on one of the tension, the, the penalties are going to be much higher, and so forth. So there's a certain level of, um, let's say, sanity that you can attribute to those types of motivations. Um, somebody who is just blinded with hatred or rage, they're not expecting to probably even get out of that situation alive. So um, it makes it very difficult to apprehend those types of people or to negotiate with them or something like that. Which is why a lot of times in, in active shooter or active attacker cases, you, you see that you know 
the person who's doing the attacking does not wind up coming out alive from those things. Active shooters often have made detailed plans of the attack. And this kind of speaks to intent. So you may have heard um, in certain court cases, uh, people are found, even if they've killed someone, they've been found innocent by reason of insanity. Have you ever heard that term before? Uh, not really, no. Okay, so, so when you're tried in a court of law, one of the things that they do is they determine whether or not you're fit for trial, meaning mentally. You know, did you know what you were doing? You know, was there intent behind it? Was there, um, was there reasoning behind your actions? And if it turns out that you're not and you were mentally incapacitated for whatever reason, you could be found not guilty by reason of insanity, and then you're, you're put into a, a rehabilitation program and stuff like that. So the reason I point that out here is that usually in an active shooter situation, someone doesn't just pick up a gun and start shooting at random. There's usually some kind of planning that's involved. And this is where uh, police try to help mitigate some of this stuff. Um, like you've heard the term before, I'm sure. If you see something, say something. Yep. And that is basically designed to try to mitigate some of this. So if you see someone at school, for instance, and they're exhibiting antisocial behaviors or they're always angry or they're, they stay to themselves and they don't talk to people and they don't want to be bothered with people. Some of these are signs of someone who may be on the verge of something like this type of activity. So authorities ask you to, if you see this, let someone know. Because even if that is the case, when these active shooter situations come up, it's not the first time it's usually not the first instinct that they have. So usually by the time you get to an active shooter stage, these people have been, you know, bullied or uh, there's been a repeated pattern of things to, to get them to that point. So the idea is if you can spot that early on, even if it's just casual observation, then you can alert someone and they can intervene. They can help the person if they need help, they can alleviate whatever problems they might be having. But basically, you know, to coin a term, they can talk them down off the ledge before they get up on the ledge and prevent these things from happening. Because once they start happening, there's not a whole lot you can do. Uh, active shooters often but not always are suicidal. So these are guys who, when they plan on doing these things, they may have a very methodical plan of what they're going to do but they often plan on not coming back from it when they do it. And in some situations, active shooters choose a location for tactical advantage. One of these um, was a shooting decades ago at a college, I believe it was Texas, and they went up into a clock tower with an arsenal of weapons and a load of ammunition and the person up in the clock tower was basically shooting people on the ground. And it was nearly impossible to get to them uh, to stop them. So it was a tactical advantage of what, you know, what they were doing. When we had the uh, Washington, D.C. shooters years ago, uh, they were actually concealing themselves in the trunk of a car and sniping people from the trunk of a car so they couldn't be seen. So... Um, Usually what this happen, what happens with, with stuff like this is they've got time to plan it out. They're familiar with the area. They know the patterns of their victims, you know, what doors keep people are going to be leaving from at what times. And they'll set themselves up in a position where they can do the most damage. Which means they're not insane when they do this. They're very methodical usually. So that's just some of the things to keep in mind with active shooters questions nope does this scare you yes yeah it is frightening i don't it? really like talking about this stuff it just 
brings my mind back to too many thoughts. Yeah, and unfortunately, it's one of those things where you kind of have to talk about it in order to understand how to deal with it. Um, hopefully, you'll never have to deal with it, but having had the discussion, and hopefully at the end of this podcast, you'll at least have some idea of how to protect yourself and defend yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's move on to good practices for coping with active shooter situations next. So in your uh, lockdown drills at school, do they, what do they teach you? Is it everything that's done as a group or give me some idea of what your lockdown training is? Basically everyone is told during a full lockdown drill to go in a certain corner of the room where no, since we have like little windows in the doors, so um, we go in a corner of the room where we won't be seen. And sometimes we're allowed to bring like our heavy books in case there is someone coming in and we can hit them down at least. So they give you they give you a safety area in which that you can retreat to. Mm -hmm. uh, do they teach you anything about defending yourself? Only that like you could bring your tech a huge textbook and then just if the person do, if a person does come in you could just start whacking them. They basically can do most of the attacks. They just like. And at least two of my teachers that I know during lockdown drills, they got like a bat and would like, and and was ready to hit the, the person if they came in. Okay, so they're not putting the the onus of defending on the kids. The teachers are taking that on themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, hopefully from from what we go over here, you'll have some idea of some other things that you can do because it sounds like your lockdown drills really only cover a few situations, you know, and, and ones that circle around you being in the classroom, right? Like, do they do lockdown drills with you being on the playground or in the lunchroom or anything like that? I remember there was this one where we had a, where we were outside and there was a lockdown drill and we had no idea what to do, but then, like, we just sat on the wall, um, on the wall of the building for a while quiet just like on the wall in a line okay i act, i honestly haven't had any other time where we actually stayed out um at, during a lockdown drill okay well this information hopefully will help you both in school and out of school so the first thing they say about good practices for coping with an active shooter is be aware of your environment and any possible dangers so the first thing to, to think of there is, all right, where are your exits? How do you get out of the building? How do you get out of the room you're in? How do you secure those entrances? Okay, so that's another one to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, take note of the two nearest exits in any facility that you visit. And this isn't just school. This is anywhere. You go to a movie theater, you know, even for fire drill purposes, know where the exits are at all times. Know how close you are. Estimate how long it would take you to run to those exits. Because in an active shooter situation, there are windows of opportunity, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So if you're in an office, stay there and secure the door. Same thing in a schoolroom. If, if that door locks, or if it can be barricaded or anything, secure the room itself and stay in the room. You'll be safer there. Because again, we're only looking to buy 10 to 15 minutes, right? So, uh, if you're in a hallway, get into a room and secure the door. The last place you want to be in an active shooter situation is a hallway because it's what's called a choke point. You know, you're, you're basically in a shooting gallery at that point. So you want to get out of that as quickly as possible. Um, as a last resort, and this is especially for kids as an absolute last resort, you can attempt to take the active shooter down. And I think this is sort of what your teachers were telling you about with your books. Uh, when the shooter is at close range and you can't flee, so assuming they come in the room, for instance, uh, your chance of survival is much greater if you try to incapacitate the shooter. Um, but only do that as a last resort. The last, you know, you're not trained, you're not armed, you're not prepared to take on an attacker. 
unless you have no other choice. Um, and then obviously call 911 when it's safe to do so. So your first priority is to make sure you're safe. Get yourself to safety. And uh, after that, then you warn someone. It's not your job to go in there and save anybody or stop the shooter or anything like that. Um, in taking down a shooter, there's a couple of very easy techniques that you can use. Um, there are very vulnerable parts of the human body. So let me ask you if a shooter walked into the classroom, had you cornered and you had no place to run, how would you try to incapacitate that shooter? Well, I'd either punch him in the nose, kick his knee, or or punch his stomach, or try to. And afterwards, I'll try to escape under his arm or something. Right, and and there, that's exactly what I would suggest. You know, the weak points that you want to go for are the knees, because chances are they're going to be bigger than you, so you're not going to probably have too much access to their face. Go for the knees, go for the groin, go for the throat, and go for the eyes. Anything from the neck up is usually fair game in that situation. A punch to the throat will incapacitate the person for several minutes. Um, hitting him in the face and the eyes, punching him in the nose, probably not the best thing because most that won't incapacitate most people, and mm -hmm. you know unless you're Rocky, but. Hitting him, punch, poking him in the eyes, you know, something like that. Something to incapacitate his ability to do damage. The knees, definitely important. If you can make sure he can't run after you, that's a key. Um, if, it's a, if it's a man, you're going to be far more effective kicking him in the groin um, than you would if it was a female shooter. And we're not going to discriminate here because there are female shooters just like there are male shooters out there. Mm -hmm. um, but knees to keep him from chasing you throat to keep him from being a threat at all and eyes for the same reason um so i think you got a very good handle on that and this is where the book comes in handy too because you don't want to punch someone in the knee i mean if you have a nice heavy history book you whack him in the knee edge on with it if you can because that's going to put more force into the knee and you want to do it either in the front of the knee or the side of the knee that's where it's going to do the most damage um but good, I'm, I'm glad that you're already aware of that. So next thing we're going to talk about is how to respond to an active shooter in your vicinity. You okay? I know this is kind of, the, yeah. of a disturbing topic to have to talk about. Um, if we need to stop and take a breath, you let me know. All right. So, there are, let's see, one, two, three important things to do, okay? And I think we've talked about these already in, in, at a high level, but we'll talk about them in more detail. So, in the event of an active shooter, the first thing you do is evacuate, okay? So, where are you evacuating to at school if there's an active shooter? Well, normally, if, well, if, if it's, they're like, they're in the hallway, we would try to open the window and evacuate out there, but the most, but we'd also do our fire drill thing where we'd go out the door and then out into the field. So, do you guys have a designated safe area? Well, whenever there's an evacuation drill, we always go as far away from the school as possible. Um, we'd go out the back doors to where we normally would go out for recess, and we'd just continue walking as far as we can, pretty close to the high school. Okay. Like in the middle of the high school and our school. Yeah, where you're at now, you have a good evacuation route that way because the high school's over there, additional resources to help you are over there, and you're not fenced in, you're not blocked in or anything like that. So that's a that's a good area. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, there's, if there is an accessible escape path, here's some of the suggestions that they have. Uh, attempt to evacuate the premises and be sure to do the following. One, have an escape route in plan in mind. So know where you are, know where you need to go. That's important because you might not always be able to get out your most convenient way. Evacuate regardless of whether others agree to follow or not. 
You're not there to save anybody's neck but your own. You need to keep that in mind. You're going to have people that are so scared they're not going to want to move. You're going to have some people who want to fight. You're going to have some people who don't think it's going to be that dangerous. Your job is to get out and get to safety. Number one, anybody else is on their own at that point. Uh, leave your belongings behind. There's nothing that you have at any point in time that's worth more than your life. So get out and leave everything behind. Keep your hands visible. Now, this is important. Obviously, you're not going to appear as a threat coming out of a school or a building or something like that, but you may have law enforcement in the area. You want to keep your hands visible. You don't want to have your hands in your pockets. Um, police don't know if you're concealing a weapon or something like that at that point. So keep your hands visible when you're evacuating. Follow the instructions of any police officers. Now, the first responders in there are probably not going to be the guys that are going to be leading you out. They're going to be the guys that are there to take out the shooter. So they'll give you instructions if they see you, and they'll tell you where to go. Always follow their instructions. Uh, do not attempt to move wounded people. Now, this is kind of one of the more disturbing things. You may find, in the event that this sort of thing happens, that there are people in your path that have already been injured as a result of this shooter. Do not attempt to move them. You could do them more harm than good. Okay, chances are if they were shot and are wounded and were left behind, the shooter's moved on and is not a threat to them anymore. And then, of course, the last thing is call 911 when you're safe. Now, you don't have your phone on you typically. Hopefully in a year or two you will, so you'll, you'll have a little bit more security. Um, but uh, there are other phones in the area, residences and stuff like that, that you can use a phone at. So, aside from evacuate, if you can't evacuate, hide out, okay? Now, you don't have, they've not designated any safe areas in the school other than the classrooms, have they? Mm -mm. So, they haven't shown you any place that you could hide or anything like that in the event that you can't get out? Not really. All right. Well, it, this is another one of those ones where it's important to be aware of your surroundings and know what's around you. So if evacuation is not possible, find a place to hide where the active shooter is less likely to find you. Uh, your hiding place should be out of the active shooter's view. This is where getting out of the uh, sight of the windows there. You don't want direct line of sight. Um, it should provide protection if shots are fired in your direction. Um, an office with a closed door. Now... It's important to note, depending on the weapon that they have, certain protections won't work. Um, a high-powered rifle, for instance. There's not much that you're going to be able to hide behind that's going to stop a high-powered round. So your best bet's to not be seen so they can't aim at you to shoot at you. A high-powered rifle round will go through brick. It will go through uh, heavy wooden doors. It will definitely go through windows. Uh, even fireproof doors that people think they have additional protection on. So you want to put as many layers of protection between you and the shooter as possible. And don't let them see you. Um, don't trap yourself or restrict your options of movement. Don't jump in a closet. Don't jump in a locker. You know, you want some place you have two routes that you can get in and out of if possible even if that means having to break a window to climb out a window uh, don't get into a room that's only got one way in and one way out because well that's not going to end well probably mm -hmm. uh, to prevent an active shooter from entering your place lock the door obviously if it can be locked blockade the door with heavy furniture now you may have to Get help from someone else to drag a desk or a bookshelf or something in front of the uh, door. But if you can get enough heavy material in front of that door there, you can stop someone from getting in. Um, so keeping that distance is important. Uh, if the active shooter is nearby, lock the door. Silence your cell phone and any electronic devices. Very important. The last thing you want is to be hiding quietly in a, in a room and having a, a shooter walk past and your phone ring and they know that you're in there. Um, turn off any source, source of noise, TVs, uh, radios. 
even phones, if there's phones, you might want to unplug desk phones or something like that that's there because you don't want them alerting an active shooter. And hide behind large objects like cabinets or desks. Um, your, your desks probably aren't going to be sufficient, but the teacher's desk is probably going to have a couple layers of metal in there that can help and conceal you. And most importantly, remain quiet. It's going to be scary. People are going to be upset. People are going to want to cry. Um, if you hear shots ring out, you're going to want to scream. You want to make sure you're quiet. You don't want to draw any attention to yourself. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty much common sense stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So if, the, if evacuation and hiding are not possible, remain calm. Now, it's easy to write that down and say it. You know, somebody's in your school shooting people. You're not going to remain calm. Yeah. But don't freak out. That's kind of the caveat that I'll say here. Don't freak out. You need to be able to breathe. If you start getting upset and you hyperventilate, when it comes time to run, you're not going to be able to run. So maintain your breathing. You know, keep an even steady breath. Uh, try to focus on something other than the situation at hand so that you're not obsessing over it. Dial 911 when possible to alert the police. Um, if you can't speak, and this is important because at some point in time you will have access to a cell phone in school. If you can't speak, leave the line open and allow the dispatcher to listen. They're trained. When they know that you're in a situation like that, they're trained not to talk and draw attention, but they can listen and get valuable information from that. They may hear the gunshots. They may know where the shooter is. They may hear other people describing what he looks like. All that information gets fed real time to the police that are on site there. So just having that microphone open for the dispatcher can be very helpful. And the last set of tips that we have here is to take action against the active shooter. Again, if you have no other choice, as a last resort, and only when your life is in imminent danger, attempt to disrupt or incapacitate the active shooter by acting as aggressively as possible towards him. So if you have to come at them, you want to scream, you want to yell, you want to flip your hands in the air, you want to do anything you can just to, you know, take this person off guard. You know, freak them out for just a split second, and that's the window of opportunity that you need to take action. Throwing items and improvised weapons. If you have keys, if you have pencil holders, anything that has some weight, you can throw it at them. The first thing they're going to do when they see something coming at them is they're going to defend their face. So throw stuff at the face. If they're defending their face, they can't shoot their weapon at you. So that might just be the distraction you need to run out of the room at that point in time. Yelling, like I said, and committing to your actions. Don't hesitate. If you're going to run, run. If you're going to charge them, charge them. If you're going to throw something, do it. Don't hesitate because the second you hesitate is the window of opportunity. They need to respond to that. So commit and go all in. Okay. All good information? Yep. All right. Let's talk about what happens when the law enforcement arrives when we come back. So law enforcement's purpose is to stop the active shooter as soon as possible. The officers will proceed directly to the area in which the last shots were hurt. Officers usually arrive in teams of four. They're not going to come in one at a time, typically. Officers may wear regular patrol uniforms or external bulletproof vets, vests, Kevlar helmets, or other tactical equipment. We have uh, joint SWAT teams, special weapons and tactics teams in our area here. These are the guys that come in with the body armor on. They come in with automatic weapons. They'll have head protection. They'll have probably some kind of face protection on. So you're probably not going to recognize them for who they are because you're not going to see their face but they will come in in teams and ready to, to respond. Uh, officers may be armed with rifles, shotguns, or handguns. 
Um, rifles usually aren't best for close quarter tactics because you just don't have the room. Usually they'll have carbines, which are smaller rifles. They'll have shotguns because shotguns are relatively safe in situations like that because mm. the um, the rounds from the shotguns usually don't penetrate walls. Mm. So in the event that they have to open fire, they can do so without hitting someone behind the wall inadvertently. Um, but a lot of times it'll just be handguns. They'll come in with with semi-automatic handguns because they're easy to maneuver with. Uh, officers may use pepper spray and tear gas to control the situation. That's something you need to be aware of. Um, you've never experienced pepper gas um, or pepper spray or tear gas. It causes severe eye irritations. It causes difficulty breathing. It's not fatal typically, okay? So in order to control the situation and keep that shooter under control, they may deploy some of these things, which may affect you. If that happens, don't freak out. Be be aware that it's going to happen and understand that it's designed to suppress the entire room. So if you can't breathe, then the shooter can't breathe. That's the most important thing. They'll take the shooter down and then they'll make sure that everyone else in the area is taken care of. Pepper spray is just a matter of washing it out vigorously with water and tear gas, same sort of situation. It'll pass over time. It's discomfort, but it's not fatal and it's enough to knock someone else out um officers may shout commands and may push individuals to the ground for their safety understand these guys are there to protect you but they will do so in a way that probably seems a little rough at times um it's important that you obey any commands that they have and if they push you to the ground stay to the ground they're pushing you down there because you're in imminent danger and they want you to be as small a target as possible they will typically push you to the ground and step in front of you so that their body armor can protect both them and you in that case. Uh, so don't get scared if, if these guys tend to get a little bit rough with you. They're doing it for your own good. So how to react when law enforcement arrives. So have you had any kind of training on, on how to react when the law enforcement arrives or what to do? No, I just learned just do it. Do what they tell you to do, and that's pretty much all I really know. They've never done, actually done like actual training for that. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's okay. I mean, that's pretty basic to to do what they say. You know, the first thing is remain calm and follow the officer's instructions. You know, they're there to help you to protect you. Um, don't be asking questions or anything like that at that time. That's not the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Um. If you have information that is vital, like, for instance, if you know how many shooters there are, if you uh, know where the shooter's located, that type of information might be useful to them. Uh, put down any items in your hands. This goes back to when we say keep your hands visible. Um, when, the, when the police come in, they don't know right off the bat who the bad guys are. You know, you could have one bad guy, you could have many bad guys. You could have bad guys who know the police are there and they're going to try and pretend to be a victim now so they can get out safely. So you want to make sure that you do not pose a threat at all. Drop what you have, keep your hands in sight at all times. Immediately raise your hands, spread your fingers. This way you can't conceal a weapon behind your hand. So hands up, fingers spread. Um, keep them visible at all times. Avoid making quick movements toward officers, such as holding on to them for safety. A lot of people, you know, a lot of kids, when they in, are in a situation like this, they're looking for someone to protect them. They'll see an officer come in. They'll want to give him a hug. They want to get, you know, hold on to him or something like that. Don't do that because you're going to stop him from doing his job. Stay calm. Follow their instructions. They'll probably get behind you. They'll show you a path out. They'll direct you to someone else. Something along those lines. Don't stop and ask officers for help or directions when evacuating. Just proceed in the direction from which the officers are entering the premises. So the, the police, when they arrive, they'll secure their entrance point. So wherever they came from is the safe way out. So you always go in the direction in which they came from because you know there's more police out there for safety purposes. Again, don't do any sudden movements. Keep your hands where they can be seen. 
So what information should you provide to law enforcement or to 911? Let me ask you that. What do you think would be most helpful to provide to the police? Well, I think the most important information that you can provide to the police is um, if you know how many other shooters there are, um, if you know um, if anyone else was attacked, and um, if you know where any of them are or stuff along Yeah, and I think, I think you hit the nail right on the head there. You want to tell them where the location of the shooter is, if you know, how many there are, if there's more than one, the a physical description of the shooter, you know, he's about five feet, 10 inches tall. He's about 120 pounds. He's dressed, you know, in uh, a black jumpsuit, whatever it is. Um, the number of weapons that they have. So if you see the guy and he's holding a weapon and he's got two or three on his back and he's got one on his belt, you want to let the police know that because it gives them an idea of, you know, how quickly this guy can reload. Because one of the things that the police will do is if the guy's shooting, they'll wait for him to stop shooting because he has to reload. Well, knowing that he has another sidearm or another gun on him tells the police they can't just rush right in when he's in the middle of reloading because he can pull another gun out and start shooting. So that's very important information. Um, and the other thing is how many or the number of potential victims at the location. Like we said before, if you see someone who's hurt, don't try and move them. But keep a count of how many people you've seen down. Let the police know so the police, I have an idea of how many people that they're looking for for immediate medical assistance. Um, and just a final thought on some things to be aware of when law enforcement arrives. So like I had mentioned earlier, the first officers to arrive on the scene will not stop to help injured persons. Their priority is to get the shooter and secure the area. Uh, expect rescue teams comprised of additional officers and emergency medical personnel to follow the initial officers. So the first thing that you'll get is you'll get the guys who are coming in with the body armor on, with their weapons drawn. Their job is to stop the shooter. Once they're through and they've secured the area, they'll sweep the rooms as they go down and secure the area. Then you'll see additional officers come in escorting emergency medical personnel. These are the guys who will keep the area secure and let the EMTs do their job helping people and getting people out of there. The rescue teams will treat and remove any injured persons. So they're not, they're going to triage them right there. They're going to try and stop any immediate bleeding, but they're not going to really work on them there. They're going to try and get them out of that area because the area may become insecure at some point. They may also call upon able-bodied individuals to assist in removing the wounded from the premises. This is probably something you're not going to have to worry about. If anything, they'll probably have teachers or other uh, officers, non-critical officers, help with this type of thing. But just be aware you may see some of your teachers going back into the building in the event that they need assistance with this stuff. Once you have reached a safe location or an assembly point, you will likely be held in that area by law enforcement until the situation is under control and all witnesses have been identified and questioned. So this is important because what's going to happen is they're going to lock down the entire area. We're not just talking about the school. We're talking about probably a four or five block area around it. So parents aren't going to be able to get in. School buses aren't going to be able to get in. No one's going to get in or out of this perimeter until the police are secure, have secured it, and have questioned everyone they need to question. Okay. So even after they bring the shooter out or they've stopped the shooter, expect to be there for quite some time under the protection of the police. Mm-hmm. Um, don't leave until law enforcement authorities have instructed you to do so. So you may get impatient there waiting around because they may have to talk to a lot of people. But by that point in time, the area is going to be safe. You're going to be safe. Mommy and daddy are going to be freaking out because we can't get to you. Um, and we'll probably be right on the edge of the perimeter 
itching to get through as soon as the police let us through to get you. But the police will have you protected at that point in time. And you'll probably have your teachers with you at that point, too, um, to try and keep things calm and, and keep you guys informed. So that's what I had. So a lot of this information is serviceable outside of school, but being aware of what to do, you know, hide first. If you can get out, get out. If you can't get out, you're in immediate danger. Do something to incapacitate this guy or freak him out or distract him. You know, you see in the movies all the time, oh, I'm going to throw something over there and he's going to go look over there and I'll go this way. It doesn't always work that way, but sometimes it does, and it's enough of a distraction to get out. Um, but don't do anything stupid. You know, don't don't try to be a hero. Don't try to, you know, carry somebody out. Worry about yourself. Get yourself to safety. Once you get yourself to safety, then you can provide information and notify the police and everything else. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. Hope to God that you'll never need this. Uh, unfortunately, in the world that we live in today, it seems more and more likely that these things are going to continue to happen, though. So that was all I had. Did you have any questions, comments, concerns? Nope. No? All right. So we will uh, we will come back. We'll get your final thoughts and uh, shout-outs. I turn it over to you. All righty. So to the audience out there, I just want to say, if you've ever been in an active shooting um, or ever will be in an active shooting, I would definitely recommend all the tips we've provided. If they aren't, if for some reason you don't feel this is enough for you, you can always, of course, like we said in the beginning, search it up again. There are plenty of websites on what to do, on what to, on how to act during an active shooting. And God, and like my dad said to me, God help, God, please hope that we don't, you guys don't have to use this information, but it's always good to keep this in the back of your mind. All right. Any shout outs this week? Um, How about we give a shout out to the family of the victims of the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting yes. and uh, wish for a speedy recovery for those who were injured and uh, offer our condolences to the families who lost loved ones in the shooting. I think that's a perfect shout out, Daddy. All right. I think that is all we had for today. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back next week with uh, a lighter topic. This one was kind of heavy, but I think it was kind of poignant given the events we've had to deal with. Yeah. Uh, that's all for this week. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>